Edward, welcome to Here and Now. Thank you. Well, that piece was obviously very strongly influenced by images of the natural world. I mean, how long have you actually felt that very strong connection with nature? Probably since I perceived anything. I, I suppose the, the, the interest in the living world, in the wild world, has not always been just sonic. It's also mm. visual, behavioural. Um, it's to do with a sense of place and the place of the senses in a place, if that doesn't sound too complicated. So, as early as I can remember, but, but never with one sense being more dominant than the other. I never have been able to disconnect the idea of seeing from hearing any more than I've easily been able to, to separate the, the notion of a scientific mode of thinking from a creative or intuitive way of thinking. So does it surprise you in a way that, that so many people apparently can do that, can split themselves? Well, I think that um, some of the reasons why, let's say, one art form or one mode of self-expression like the fine arts could be split from say the acoustic arts from theatre from text has to do with training education to do with an historical sense of there being special grammars texts sub languages plots scenes scenarios mm -hmm. that define the theatre person from the musician uh, the musician from the dauber and 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 maverick painter um and so on um once once you remove the idea of there being an end product that a painting is a painting on a wall that a piece of music such as the one we'll be hearing in a little while, is a piece of music, or a piece of theatre is a piece of theatre, and is on a stage or in that kind of context. Once you start thinking about an end product, and you start thinking, well, what is this? It's actually things happening. It's actions and reactions of things. Mm. And all actions and reactions have a formal, dynamic excitability to them. Literally excitability. Everything vibrates. And at that level, there's no split. Everything is a kind of union, a kind of unity between one thing and another. And when you read writings by people like Lawrence van der Post, Goethe, Paul Clay, even Messiaen, um, and you see them saying, let alone scientists like Leibniz, um, Heidegger, philosophers, talking about everything having a tissue of connection, and then you come to, say, James Lovelock with Gaia theory, that the Earth is one huge, enormous, interactive, knowing, self-conscious organism, the notion that um, I am either a painter or a composer or a performer or a writer of novels or, or children's books is secondary to simply loving playing with form. Well, let's talk about one of the most defining moments of your career, mm. uh, which was when you went off to Australia in the 1980s. Mm. And of course, you had been very successful here. You'd been lecturing, you'd had proms commissions, mm. uh, you'd been working with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Why did you go? Um, fatigue, um, with being in one place for too long, perhaps, um, by which I mean not Britain in general, but, but the Northwest in particular. Um, a spirit of adventure, um, easily captured, easily seduced by a new, a new powerful experience. But I flew to Australia in 1981 to research what was then going to be an opera on the Australian bush ranger Ned Kelly. Um, after seven years of battles, I, I abandoned that. But, two or three days in the Australian bush and I was drawn in by its seductive sometimes terrifying awesome spaciousness its sense of timelessness brazenness richness um, color form um, and I also wanted I also wanted to to establish a new kind of education in the arts which was what was then called fusion studies in the arts which was saying there are as I've just been saying just now no boundaries no limitations and I'd given a series of lectures to, at several different universities in Australia, one of which was called Arts Fusion Theory and Practice. And the Vice-Chancellor said, if we gave you, I better not mention how much, but X million dollars worth of equipment and space and buildings, would you put your body where your mouth has just been? And, um, you know, if you combine that, that I, I'm, I'm also a passionate teacher. It's something you didn't mention when you introduced me. I mean, I'm an obsessively passionate teacher, and I do believe all art teaches. But I also believe that all teaching has an art to it as well and so those things coupled it was too it was too good a, an opportunity to miss and i didn't think i'd stay there that long so did it live up to your dreams oh beyond those i mean it, yeah it's way beyond dreams I, I i have no regrets about the experience it was tremendously enriching in every sense with all my senses um but ultimately frustrating in terms of of having access to enough musicians especially vocalists so that was really why you decided to come back, was it? 
Yeah, I mean, my deepest love of music came through being a chorister, through singing choral music. And whilst there are many fabulous musicians in Australia and quite a lot of, of, of great soloists, there are very few ensembles. And it's not the choral tradition only that I'm talking about. It is the fact that if you collect a lot of human beings together, male and females, you've got an incredible spectrum as well as spectre um, mm -hmm. of acoustic invention um, with that clustering of, of, of instruments. Um, and, and that was a sort of irresistible gravity. And it's that excitement about uh, about using the voice that I think comes over very strongly in the piece we're going to hear next, which is Phase Portraits, uh, which features 24 voices plus harp, celeste, harpsichord and piano. Mm. Perhaps I should just explain what, what um, why it's called Phase Portraits. A phase portrait arises out of scientists' understanding of the way matter behaves. It all moves, it all vibrates. Now, you're sitting opposite me in a recording studio. If I wanted to get a phase portrait of you, I would ask you to move in your seat six times in, in different positions. And if I could gather all those different positions of yourself together, I'd have six phase portraits. But if I also could predict what each of those stages of your movements was going to produce as you as revealing your form to me, I would have a total phase portrait. So a phase portrait is the way in which one measures a whole of something by, by recognizing or asking to it to move into different positions. Matter does it of its own accord, but you can have a phase portrait with anything. I can do a phase portrait with a, a glass, with my own body, with um, anything, with an ice cream. <laughs> so that's how phase portraits has arisen. Mm. And it's in four movements, and they're in two different kinds of treatments. The first two movements that we're going to hear are phase portraits which relate to two different concepts of self, myself. Myself and my relationship with the BBC Singers. So there are phase portraits of earlier works that I've composed for the BBC Singers, including works like Gazangbok. And that goes back to, what, 1974 5. And I've taken cross-sections of those pieces and brought them back. Um, the second phase portrait is the, is the phase portraits of my own relationship to returning to the UK, to this landscape. So that in both movements, there are strong references to linear configurations of landscape, to sunrises and sunsets, to the John Constable coiling clouds, to deciduous leafy woodlands, th things that are quite different from the Australian landscape. How can they be represented in music? By an intuitional transfer or relocation of a sensation of looking at and studying and listening to what happens as a result of those two processes at the same time. So the two, the two first movements, very lyrical, with very strong tonal tendencies. The, the last two movements, third and fourth, have to do with, with the mathematical concepts of phases, to do with atomic patterns. When things collide, they cause incredible diffraction patterns. And I did use several groups of mathematical systems to help me to design rhythmic sequencing for both of those movements, and, and, and listeners will hear that they're quite complex. Does that make sense? I hope it does. <laughs>